Mission is a vast topic with many dimensions and sometimes a lot of disagreement among Christians as to what it really involves and whether some things have priority over others. And in this lecture, I want to say that we need to integrate every dimension of our mission around the centrality of the biblical gospel. So here's my title. It's Living the Story, Integral Mission, and the Centrality of the Gospel. And my point is this, that while there are lots of things that mission can involve for all of us, we need to integrate them, that is, hold them together around the centrality of the good news of the Bible, about all that God has done in Christ. Because that's where we really have to start, isn't it? I mean, before we talk about our mission, we need to think about the mission of God. What does the Bible tell us, the whole Bible story tell us about the overarching plan and purpose of God for his whole creation and for the whole human race? Well, one of the most concise answers to that question, I think, was given by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, where we read this. Paul says, God has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Now, when Paul speaks about God's will, he doesn't usually mean God's personal guidance for our own individual lives. No, he's usually talking about God's great cosmic purpose throughout all time and space. And that's certainly what he's talking about here when he speaks of all things in heaven and earth. He means that the mission of God is to bring healing and unity to his whole creation through Christ and under Christ. That's what the whole great drama of scripture is leading to. That's God's cosmic agenda, God's mission. I'm sure you've probably heard of the Cape Town Commitment, the document that arose from the third Lausanne Congress in South Africa in 2010. And here's how it puts it. And as I read these paragraphs in just a moment, listen out for the echoes of scripture from Genesis to Revelation. Here we go. It says, we are committed to world mission because it is central to our understanding of God, the Bible, the church, human history, and the ultimate future. The whole Bible reveals the mission of God to bring all things in heaven and on earth into unity under Christ, reconciling them through the blood of his cross. In fulfilling his mission, God will transform the creation that is broken by sin and evil into the new creation in which there is no more sin or curse. God will fulfill his promise to Abraham to bless all the nations on earth through the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, the seed of Abraham. God will transform the fractured world of nations that are scattered under the judgment of God into the new humanity that will be redeemed by the blood of Christ from every tribe and nation and tongue and language and will be gathered to worship our God and Savior. God will destroy the reign of death and corruption and violence when Christ returns to establish his eternal reign of life, justice and peace. And then God, Emmanuel, will dwell with us and the kingdom of the world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. Now, we may well say hallelujah, amen to that. I hope perhaps you did. Yes, indeed, let's praise God for this great mission that God himself will assuredly accomplish. But you see, we're still left with this so what question, aren't we? What about us? Who are we as God's people? And what are we here for? What is our mission? Well, at the very least, we have to say that our mission surely must be to participate with God in God's mission, or as Paul put it, to be co-workers with God, working together with God, as he said in 1 Corinthians 3. And that means, doesn't it, that God calls us into a very big agenda, because it means that whatever we do in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ must reflect and in some sense respond to what God himself is doing or what God wills to be done through his people. So with that in mind then, let's think about how we might define the mission of the church. 
Now, there have been many proposals, of course, to define and describe what the mission of the church is. And one that I find particularly helpful, and I'm not saying it's the only one or the best one, but I find it helpful, was produced by the Anglican Consultative Council back in 1984, actually. And it was conceived as a mission statement for the worldwide Anglican communion. And then it was adopted by the Lambeth Conference of Bishops in 1988 as what they call the five marks of mission, five marks of mission. Uh, I'll, I'll read what they said, but here's, if I can share my screen again uh, and, and bring this back. Here it is, in a sense, as a diagram with these five words around, that the mission of the church, they said, is the mission of Christ, one, to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, two, to teach, baptize, and nurture new believers, three, to respond to human need by loving service, four, to seek to transform unjust structures of society, and five, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain the life of the earth. And as you can see in the diagram, I think these could be summarized in these few words, evangelism, teaching, compassion, justice, and the responsible use and care of creation. And all of these five marks of mission, I think, do have deep roots in the whole Bible. In fact, I would say that all five of them can be considered as ways in which we do actually participate in the mission of God. Because when, when we do these things, God is actively at work with us. For the Bible shows us that God is passionately concerned about all of them. And I also think actually that all five of these marks of mission can be linked directly or indirectly to the Great Commission, as we call it, at the end of Matthew's Gospel, and indeed integrated around it, provided we do what the diagram does, and that is that we put right at the center of all of them the great opening affirmation of Jesus in the Great Commission, that is the Lordship of Christ over all creation. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. So that's essential we do that because all of these five dimensions of mission depend upon the Lordship of Christ. They are linked together, they are integrated by the centrality of the gospel truth that Jesus is Lord. That is the gospel of the kingdom of God. King Jesus, Jesus is Lord. However, I prefer when I can to make things simpler. And I think we can do that by putting some things together within this diagram in a way that creates three major missional tasks or perhaps three focal points for our missional engagement, the church and society and creation. So here's a way of doing that. On the left-hand side of the diagram, we're talking about building the church through evangelism and teaching, bringing individuals to repentance and faith and baptism and obedience as disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then on the other side of the diagram, serving society through works of compassion and justice in response to Jesus, who sends us out into the world, as he said, to love and to serve, to be salt and light, to be doers of good, as the Apostle Paul said so often, or to seek the welfare of the people around us, as Jeremiah told the Israelites in Babylon in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 7. And then thirdly, at the bottom, caring for creation through the godly use of the resources of creation, along with ecological concern and care for the earth. And that, in my opinion, is to be fulfilling the first great commission that was given to humanity in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, where we were told to exercise authority over the earth by caring and keeping it. Now, at this point, somebody might well ask, but hang on a moment, doesn't the Great Commission just tell us to go and evangelize the world? Well, no, actually, it doesn't just say that. It's not a single command, but several there at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And indeed, it doesn't start with a command at all. It starts with a statement. All authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, said Jesus. Everything flows from that, from the cosmic 
creational lordship of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's so important, as I've said, to put that right at the center. That's what I mean by the centrality of the gospel, the gospel that Jesus is Lord. Because you see, we, we build the church because Jesus is Lord of the church. And we also serve society because Jesus, not Caesar or any of his successors, is Lord of every nation and government and culture, whether he's acknowledged as such or not. And we care for creation because Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. The earth is the Lord's, said the psalmist and quoted by the Apostle Paul. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So every dimension of our mission then flows from the Lordship of Christ and from God's unbreakable promise, as we saw in Ephesians 1, that the whole world and all creation will ultimately come to recognize Jesus as Lord, and in doing so will come to know and to love and to praise and worship our Creator and Redeemer God. So let's now go around those three main focal points that were on the screen a moment ago, and I shall just get them back up for us. Here they are. Uh, and, and see how they connect to the Great Commission in each case. And here's the first. Uh, that is that we are to be building the church through evangelism and teaching, those first two marks of mission. Go and make disciples of all nations, said Jesus, baptizing them and teaching them. And of course, baptizing new believers must presuppose the task of evangelism, which, as we rightly saw, has to be the first mark of mission. Evangelism basically means gospeling. It's, it's the same word in Greek, actually. Gospeling the good news of what God has promised and accomplished through Christ. It means telling the whole story of what God has done from both parts of the Bible, Old and New Testament. It announces the good news that the God who created the world has acted to save the world from the consequences of human sin and satanic evil, telling the, the story that God has done this through his son, Jesus of Nazareth, who came in fulfillment of God's promise to Israel. He was God's anointed and appointed Messiah. He died for our sins on the cross, and he was raised again to life by the power of God. And that this same Jesus is now ascended and reigning Lord, and that he will return as judge and as king to claim his inheritance along with redeemed humanity from every nation in the new creation. So evangelism means announcing this good news of what God has done through Christ, and then inviting people to turn in repentance from whatever false world story that they're living in, and to put their faith in this Jesus for their salvation. And when they do make that response, then we can assure them in God's name that they now have a part in that great Bible story of God's planned future for the whole world. They will know that their sin is forgiven, that they can enjoy a right relationship with God, both now and for all eternity. And so with that response, they can be baptized into relationship with the living God as their Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So, you see, when I talk about the centrality of the gospel, by the gospel, I don't just mean a formula, just a prayer that will somehow get us up into heaven. No, according to the New Testament, the gospel means this good news of actual events, the historical events through which God has acted to save the world. The gospel is the Bible's cosmic story of the redemption of all God's creation promised in the Old Testament, accomplished by the death and resurrection of Jesus the Lord, and embodied in the kingdom of God that is at work in the world and will one day be consummated at Christ's return in glory. So evangelism is announcing those events, telling that story, God's story. And that good news, as Paul says, is the power of God unto salvation. And here's one other thing. When I speak about the centrality of the gospel, 
I don't mean a center that makes everything else just peripheral, just marginal, unimportant, out there, far away from the center. No, I mean central in the way that a hub is central to a wheel. You see, a, a wheel is an integrated functioning object with a rim, a tire that's in contact with the, the road, but that full circle of the rim and the tire must be connected at every point of the hub at the center of the wheel through the spokes. And in that sense, the hub is the integrating center of all that a wheel is and does. And then of course, if it's the wheel of a car, that hub is connected to the engine, which is transmitting the power from the engine to where the rubber hits the road, as we might say. And in this analogy or this picture for integral mission, the engine is the dynamic power of the biblical gospel. It's what God has done in Christ to save the world. And the hub, well, that's our sharing of that good news, transmitting, as it were, the power of the gospel into the world. And the rim or the tire, well, that's the embodiment of the gospel in the world, in the context, in life and work, and in all our engagement with our society and our culture. So you see, to engage in integral mission, you need this integration between the, the facts, the truth of the gospel, that's the engine, and the declaration of that in evangelism, that's the hub, and then the embodiment of it in social and contextual engagement with society and creation, the tire. And that brings us then to our second mark of mission in this essential task of building the church, because Jesus also said, didn't he, teaching them. Make disciples, teaching them. You see, in the uh, Great Commission itself, Jesus immediately added this command, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is, we are to make disciples the way Jesus himself made disciples. The seed, as he put it, needs deep soil, good roots, in order to bear fruit. So churches need not only to be planted through evangelism, but also watered, as it were, through teaching. Both evangelism and teaching are included in the Great Commission. They are integral, essential parts of our mission. But they're also part of the mission of God, because God himself is at work, not only bringing people to faith in Christ, but also bring them to maturity in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit, who lives within them with his gifts and his power and bearing his fruit in their lives. Now, teaching is deeply rooted in the Bible. In fact, it was an essential part of the way that God called and shaped and educated his people Israel in the Old Testament, where we find such an emphasis on teaching within the family and by the priests and the prophets and the wise men and so on. So it's not at all surprising that when Jesus comes along, he comes as a teacher. Of course, he was much more than that, but they called him rabbi because he taught. From the moment he called his disciples to follow him, he was teaching, teaching, teaching. Because Jesus knew that making disciples doesn't happen overnight. And then if we move on from Jesus and think about Paul, Paul, of course, yeah, we often think of him as the great missionary church planter. But what is also clear is that teaching was integral to Paul's missionary work. Now, of course, quite often he had to leave a newly planted church pretty quickly under threat because of violence. But when Paul had the opportunity, as for example in Ephesus, he stayed there for nearly three years. And in that time, his constant teaching transformed a small group of just 12 disciples that he found there when he arrived into a city church with several households and functioning elders. And Paul reminds those elders, doesn't he, in, in Acts chapter 20, the elders of the church of Ephesus, that he had taught them not only what was helpful for them, but he said the whole counsel of God, which I think means the whole scriptural revelation of God's great plan and purpose. And when Paul couldn't personally do that teaching himself, well, he made sure that somebody else was doing it, part of his missionary team, people like Timothy or Titus or Apollos, uh, rather like Apollos. He's a great cross-cultural missionary. He came from Alexandria in North Africa. 
He was a Jew. He learned the scriptures. That means, of course, the Old Testament. And he was also a gifted teacher. And then he gained some more theological education himself in the home of Priscilla and Aquila over in Asia. So he went from Africa to Asia. And then he went on to Corinth in Europe, where he systematically engaged in a teaching program. This is what Luke tells us about Apollos in his work in Corinth at the end of Acts chapter 18, that Apollos was a great help to those who by grace had believed this young church that had been planted by Paul. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Or in our kind of theological language, Apollos was engaged in Old Testament hermeneutics, Christology, and apologetics. He was a theological educator. Now, here's my point. Paul and Apollos were both obeying the Great Commission. Because later on, when the Christians in Corinth divided up into factions with some boasting their loyalty to Paul and some saying, no, we like Apollos better, Paul wouldn't allow it. Yes, Paul was the evangelistic church planter, and yes, Apollos was a theological church educator, but they shared a common mission. Paul insists that the evangelist, the planter, and the teacher, the waterer, they have one purpose, he says, a single mission. In Greek, he says they are one. So that's why I think that we need to recognize that teaching within the church, whether it comes from pastor, from the pulpit, or in a seminary, in a theological college, theological education, as we now call it, is an intrinsic part of mission. It's not an extra. It's not ancillary to the real mission. It doesn't just come along after the mission's been done. No, if we take Jesus seriously, then teaching is included within our obedience to the Great Commission. It's part of biblical mission. So that then is our task of building up the church through evangelism and teaching, that left-hand side of our diagram. And we do both of those because Jesus is Lord of the church and of every disciple. And so we turn then to the other side of the diagram where we see serving society through compassion and justice. Now, where is that, you might be asking, in the Great Commission? Well, I see it plainly implied in what Jesus says in verse 18 when he says, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Now, as we read the Gospels, we see that Jesus had plenty to say to his disciples about compassion and love and justice. But first of all, just for a moment, listen to that phrase, observe all that I have commanded you. See, because that sounds very like a deliberate echo of the way Moses, or sometimes God himself, addressed the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy. Again and again, they would say, be careful to observe all that I, the Lord your God, command you this day. And here's Jesus saying almost exactly the same words. Now, in the book of Deuteronomy, it's very clear that what God commanded Israel was to reflect God's own character, to be like God by walking in his ways. Now, listen just for a moment to one example of this from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 19, where Moses says this, he says, I'm quoting, the Lord your God is God of gods, Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome. He shows no partiality. He accepts no bribes. So he can't be corrupted. He defends the cause of the fatherless, the orphan and the widow. And he loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing. And then the next verse, and you are to love those who are foreigners, for you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. Now, that's just one example that could be multiplied many times from Deuteronomy and indeed throughout the whole of the Old Testament scriptures, the scriptures that so saturated the mind of Jesus that God wanted his people, Israel, to be like God by showing compassion and seeking justice for the poor and the needy, the homeless, the family-less, the land-less, just as God had done for Israel themselves when they were in need. You see, because remember back in the Exodus, God had demonstrated his compassion 
his concern for the suffering Hebrew slaves, and he had exercised his justice in delivering them out of the oppression of Egypt. And so God then commands them, the Israelites, to embody the same compassion and justice in their own social and political and economic life. And so in the same way, and almost in the same tone of voice, Jesus is saying to his disciples, now look, your mission is to make disciples and teach them to obey what I have commanded you, which is in line with all that God commanded his people throughout the whole scriptures. I mean, even if we just look back in Matthew's gospel, we find this note again and again. Remember Matthew chapter 5, verse 6 in the Beatitudes, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice. Now, that last word is often, of course, translated righteousness in English, and we often tend to confine that to just being right with God, justified by faith, and of course it includes that. But for Jesus and the scriptures of the Old Testament, the word meant not only a right relationship with God, but right and just and fair relationships on earth, justice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for that, said Jesus. Or as he added in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek first God's kingdom and his justice, righteousness. And then, of course, there are those famous words of Jesus, you are the light of the world, there in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 to 16. I mean, what on earth did Jesus mean by telling that bunch of disciples that they were the light of the world in such a sweeping statement? Well, look carefully at what Jesus actually stresses when he explains what he means by light. He says, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Not that they may hear your great testimony or listen to your wonderful preaching, but see your good deeds. Of course, they did have a message to preach. Of course they did. We've just been saying that. The good news of the kingdom must be shared. They must tell that good news. But when Jesus talks about light here, he's speaking about lives, the way we live in a way that is attractive, filled with goodness and mercy and love and compassion and justice. And once again, you know, what we see here is Jesus drawing from this strong Old Testament tradition. Because God had called Israel to be a light to the nations. That's what he calls them in Isaiah. And that light to the nations included the quality of their lives as a society. You see, light has this strongly ethical, social dimension. Listen again to the prophet Isaiah as I read from Isaiah chapter 58. And just notice the connection between light and righteousness, which I think is the one that Jesus is making. God asks them, is not this the kind of fasting that I've chosen, the, the, the kind of religion that I want? It's to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and provide the poor wanderer with shelter? And when you see the naked to clothe them, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your righteousness will go before you. And he continues, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will shine in the darkness. You see, light shines from people who are committed to compassion and justice in the world and show it in practice. And I'm sure that's something of what Jesus had in mind. So then, back in the Old Testament, God commanded Israel to be a people who are committed to practical down-to-earth exercise of compassion and justice in their society in ways that would reflect God's own character, the God who cares for the poor and the needy, the God who defends the cause of the widow and orphan. And Jesus both endorsed that scriptural mandate for his own disciples, and then in the Great Commission, he commands them to pass this on to the new disciples that they would make, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And you know, they did. Because when we look at the story of the early church in the book of Acts, we marvel 
Of course we marvel at how the church grew and spread in all directions through the evangelistic preaching and church planting of the apostles. But we should not overlook how the apostles and those first little Christian communities of believers showed a strong commitment to this other dimension of the Great Commission. That is to obeying what Jesus himself had taught about social and economic compassion and justice. Luke tells us twice in the book of Acts that this early community of Jesus followers in Jerusalem, even before they were called Christians, how they sought to work out their spiritual unity through economic sharing. And so we read, for example, that all the believers were one in heart and mind. That's their unity. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there was sharing and there was preaching. And God's grace was so powerfully at work among them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought money from the sale and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, what's very interesting in that account in Acts 4, as you can see on the screen, is that whether consciously or not, they were fulfilling another word of God in Deuteronomy. At least Luke seems to think so in recording this, because when Luke writes, there were no needy persons among them, he is repeating almost word for word the Greek translation of Deuteronomy 15, chapter verse 4, where God had said, there need be no poor people among you, if only you will fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to obey all these commands I'm giving you today. So that's the book of Acts. And what about the Apostle Paul? Well, we usually think, don't we, that Paul's first missionary journey with Barnabas was when they were sent by the church in Antioch after a word from the Holy Spirit to preach the gospel and plant churches in Asia Minor, the story you will read in Acts chapter 13. But actually, the first time that Saul of Tarsus, Saul and Barnabas were sent, that's the word, by the church in Antioch after a word from the Holy Spirit was actually to take a gift to the church in Jerusalem in anticipation of the coming famine. And we read about that in Acts chapter 11. This was Paul's first missionary journey, and it was for famine relief. And I think that that first mission trip that the Apostle Paul made, made a big impression on him. So much so that he made caring for the poor part of his mission and his teaching from then on. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, because he tells us. He tells us in the second chapter of what may well have been his earliest letter, the letter to the Galatians, and there Paul describes a very significant moment in his missionary career when he went up to Jerusalem to meet with the other apostles there. And they granted him, says Paul, the right hand of fellowship. That is, they accepted and endorsed his ministry of preaching the gospel among the Gentiles. And then Paul adds this revealing comment. He says, all they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor. The very thing I had been eager to do all along, he says. It's as if he means they didn't have to ask me to do that. I was doing it anyway. For Paul, you see, practical care for the poor was an integral part of his missionary work and along with his preaching and his teaching. It was integrated into his evangelistic, church planting, church teaching work. Now, of course, there are many other passages in the New Testament which say similar things. In Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6, in James chapter 2, and 1 John chapter 3, and so on. So what I'm trying to say here is that it seems to me that Jesus and the apostles would all have agreed with this very simple affirmation that we read in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 7, that the righteous person cares about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. So for all these reasons then, which I take from the Bible, I am myself firmly convinced that gospel-centered 
Christian social engagement in the world under the Lordship of Christ is an integral, indispensable dimension of Christian mission. That is, if we are to be obedient to the Great Commission as a whole, with all its depth and biblical roots. Here's how the MICA Global has defined integral mission. It puts it like this. This is the declaration, the MICA Declaration on Integral Mission. It says, integral mission is the proclamation and demonstration of the gospel. I can read it now from the screen. Integration, integral mission, I'm sorry, is the proclamation and demonstration of the gospel. It's not simply that evangelism and social involvement are to be done alongside each other. Rather, in integral mission, our proclamation has social consequences as we call people to love and repentance in all areas of life. And our social involvement has evangelistic consequences as we bear witness to the transforming grace of Jesus Christ. If we ignore the world, we betray the word of God, which sends us out to serve the world. But if we ignore the word of God, then we've got nothing to bring to the world. I think that's well said. So that brings us then to the third element of our circle of mission commitment, integrated around the Lordship of Christ, and that is our responsible and godly use of the resources of creation and our care for creation, as I've called it here, creational responsibility, caring for creation. Once again, I can hear you asking, well, <laughs> where is that? in the Great Commission. Well, actually, you know, we could have started with this one, with creation, because actually it's where Jesus starts. As I said earlier, do you remember the Great Commission doesn't begin with a command, it begins with an affirmation. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Now that, that combination of heaven and earth was the typical Jewish Old Testament way of referring to the whole of creation, all things in heaven and on earth. And of course, it's not only where Jesus starts, it's actually where the Bible starts, isn't it? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And it's also where the Bible ends, with a new creation, a new heaven and a new earth, which we read about in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. So the whole mission of God then in the Bible, as we've seen before, runs from creation to new creation. And Jesus stands right at the center of it, claiming to be Lord over it all. You see, Jesus is he's not just up there in heaven. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth, Lord of all creation. Or as Revelation puts it, as Jesus himself says in Revelation chapter 1, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. So what that means, at least, is that whatever our mission may include, as we obey the Great Commission in, in so many multiple ways, and wherever our mission may take us, it presupposes that Jesus is Lord of all creation, that the earth belongs to Christ. He is the landlord. We are his tenants. The earth is in God's ownership, and we are stewards of it, accountable to Christ himself for what we do on the earth and with the earth. And that must surely impact how we think and act in relation to these great environmental issues of our day, how we treat the earth, the soil, the oceans, the forests, the atmosphere. You see, those are all part of creation. They all belong to Christ. And so here's how, once again, the Cape Town commitment uh, from the Lausanne movement puts it. And again, I think these are words well worth quoting. And I need to bring this up now on the screen. Let me move here. Uh, I'm a little bit behind. Uh, with this. There we are, that Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth and all creation. Here's the Cape Town commitment. We cannot claim to love God, 
which I hope we do, the first and greatest commandment, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. Well, we can't claim to love God while abusing what belongs to Christ by right of creation, redemption, and inheritance. Just pausing for that moment. You see, if you say you love somebody, you don't go about trashing their property. It just doesn't make sense to claim to love someone while you're messing around and not caring what belongs to them. So if we love God, we care for his property, what belongs to him. So if Jesus is Lord of all the earth, then we cannot separate our relationship to Christ from how we act in relation to the earth. For to proclaim the gospel that says Jesus is Lord is to proclaim the gospel that includes the earth since Christ's lordship is over all creation. Creation care is thus a gospel issue within the lordship of Christ. Well, we need to draw to a conclusion. That was from the Cape Town Commitment. We tried to survey this challenging breadth of mission and to see it all as integrated together, held together around the centrality of the gospel of the Lordship of Christ. And that integration of our mission is perhaps the most important emphasis that I want you to take away from this lecture. Let's not go on pulling apart and separating and prioritizing things which God has joined together around the Lordship of Christ. But finally, we do have to come back, don't we, to our basic question where we started. So what? What are the implications for ourselves then as Christians and as churches? What can we take from this survey of what I've called the five marks of mission or these three focal points of mission of the church and society and creation? Well, I think at least three points follow and I'll try to deal with them fairly quickly. And here's the first, that God's mission is for God's whole church. See, mission's not some specialist activity for just a few professional people, missionaries or mission partners. No, the whole church exists for the sake of God's mission. Every church is a missional church, or it's not really being church at all. Everything the church is and does should be connected in some way to the, the fundamental reason why we exist as the people of God in the first place, which is to serve the mission of God for the ultimate glory of God. However, don't be overwhelmed by this. It's not the case that everybody has got to be doing everything, but that everybody needs to be intentional about something according to our gifting and according to the leading of God. See, sometimes people say to me after I teach or preach about this whole idea of holistic mission and integral mission, and they say, well, you're talking about all these different kinds of mission, preaching the gospel, teaching theology, feeding the hungry, saving the trees and so on, but there's only one of me. I, I can't do all of that. To which my reply is, well, yeah, and I think God probably thought of that too, which is why he created the church. It takes the whole church to engage in God's whole mission. And that leads to my second, so what? If God's whole mission is for God's whole church, then the church's mission must include every church member. See, if the church as a whole exists for God's mission, then so do all its members. We really need to radically challenge and change this mistaken idea that only some members of the church are what we call mission partners or missionaries in the older language. I mean, what does that make the rest of us? We are non-mission partners or sleeping partners or, or what? Now, of course, Usually by this expression, mission partners, we mean those who are supported and sent by the church and have gone to some other kind of cross-cultural mission and they are supported and paid financially by their fellow believers. And thank God for them. That's so important. I'm not, not suggesting for a moment that we shouldn't be doing that. But let's not give the impression that mission is their job only and not something for the rest of us. I belong to All Souls Church Langham Place in London, and until recently the rector there was Hugh Palmer. 
And one Sunday he said this, it was actually a World Mission Sunday, and he said, I quote, this church sends out 1,500 mission partners every week. That's the approximate membership of the church, about 1,500. So this church sends out 1,500 mission partners every week, and some of them, he added, are serving overseas. And he was implying, of course, that the whole congregation, every week, that we are entering the mission field, as we call it, every time we walk out the doors of the church into the world outside. That's where they live and work in their everyday work and vocations and professions. And that's where the mission field is. The mission field is wherever faith meets unbelief, wherever the kingdom of God in a believer's life encounters the kingdom of this world. That's the front line of mission. And that could be next door just as much as in the next continent. So then God's whole mission is for God's whole church and the whole church's mission includes every church member. And so finally then every church member's mission must include the whole of life. There's no secular sacred divide for a Christian believer. And again, you see, we have to break this ingrained habit of thinking in two spheres, secular and sacred. It's because it, it's become such a dominating paradigm of the way people think, and perhaps especially in the Western world where I come from, that we're scarcely conscious of it. It just seems the way things are, you know? There's a religious part of life. That's what God is interested in, the church, Christian activities, worship, prayer, evangelism, and so on. And then there's the rest of life where most of us spend most of our time, the so-called secular world of family and leisure and work and sport and so on. And we assume that the whole point of that secular sphere is just to let us get a little bit of money and a bit of spare time to do whatever we can do to support the sacred sphere where the really keen Christians live people who are in, quote, full-time Christian ministry and that. And this is such a toxic, demoralizing divide because people are left thinking that what they spend most of their time doing, that is working in the so-called secular world, has got no value to God or for eternity. While they can only manage to give what spare time and money they can to the one thing that they think God really cares about, that is church work or God's work. And this is such a discouraging, disabling, and frankly, unbiblical way of looking at life. Because you see, the Great Commission begins by telling us that Jesus is Lord of all life within his creation. Jesus is Lord of the workplace and the family, Lord of the streets, Lord of the skies, Lord of schools and slums, Lord of hospitals and housing, Lord of governments and business and academia and sport and culture. Jesus is Lord of all time and space. And in all of those places, in all our vocations and callings, we are called to serve God in mission. You see, mission, mission is not just an agenda. It's not some specialized task to be tackled by special people who are appointed and paid to do it on behalf of the rest of us. No, mission is the mode of existence for the whole life of every member of God's whole church. And so may God help each one of us and each one of our churches to live with that truth governing our lives for God's glory. Amen.